Welcome back to our study of the first epistle of St. John. Today, we finish this little book. But before we get to the end, John has a few more things to tell us, a little bit more about agape love, and then some really deep topics. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all of the gifts you give us every day of our life. Gifts in extravagant abundance, generosity, and grace. We praise you for the gift of your word and for the way your word works in our hearts and in our lives. As we spend some time in your word now, we pray the gift of your Holy Spirit in rich measure. Teach us what you would have us know. Help us to believe what you teach us and to live what we believe. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. Let's go straight to the words of John. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 5, 1 to 3. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I know we've spoken a lot about the different words used for love in the Bible, in the Greek language. One passage in the Gospel of John illustrates why it's so important for us to know the different words and their individual and distinct meanings. Look at the Gospel of John, John chapter 21, starting at verse 15. John 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I philo you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I follow you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you follow me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you follow me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I follow you. As you followed along, I read the Greek words each time that the word love appears in the English language. This conversation between Jesus and Peter happened after the resurrection. Jesus had already shown himself alive to a number of the disciples a number of different times and places. On one occasion, he showed himself alive to more than 500 disciples at the same time. On this particular occasion, Jesus had fixed breakfast for the disciples on the beach. And after they had eaten, Jesus and Peter appeared to have gone for a walk. Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me the way I love you? And Peter answered, Lord, you know we're friends and I care for you deeply. It's not the same thing, is it? The same exchange happened a second time. A second time, Jesus asked, Peter, do you love me the way I love you? And the second time, Peter answered, Lord, you know we're friends. I care for you deeply. Jesus was asking one question. Peter didn't answer that question. He gave an answer of his own. The difference between the word agape and phileo. So the third time Jesus changed his word. The third time Jesus asked Peter, Peter, are we friends? Do you care for me deeply? And Peter answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that we're friends and you know that I care for you deeply. Words matter particularly the words that are in the Bible. And the word John uses in his epistle, in this first epistle, for love is always the same word. It's always agape. 
the word that the Bible uses to describe the love that God has for us. When John writes, love one another, he's calling his readers to love one another the way God loves us. It's a very high calling. Agape is tough. In today's reading, John adds one more layer to the whole meaning of agape. He begins by declaring that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. We've spoken about this before. John then goes on to declare that everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Earlier, John wrote that if we say we love God, we must love one another. We must love the children of God. Whoever loves the Father loves those who are born of him. This new layer that John adds to all this comes when he writes that this is how we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments. It would be easy to argue that John lost his train of thought. He was behaving like a confused old man. He started out writing about loving God, and then he went on to loving one another, and he ended up writing about obeying the commandments. It doesn't seem to, to make sense. It doesn't track. John had not lost his train of thought, however. In fact, he was spot on. The commandments are God's very practical way of teaching us how to love one another. Think about the commandments. The first three deal with our relationship with God and the rest of them with our relationship with one another. In the first three, we are told to have no other gods, to always keep God's name holy, and to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. This is how we love God. And the rest of the commandments, honor your father and mother, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't slander, don't covet. All of these commandments define what it means to love one another. Agape love. In agape love, in loving one another as God loves us, the greatest reason of all is given to us to protect life and marriage and reputation and property and family. The commandments reveal to us the actions that are the opposite of agape love so that driven by the spirit of God within us, we can do what is agape love. What's really peculiar is that John added the comment that the commandments are not burdensome. The Greek word translated burdensome is a fascinating word, barea, a form of the root barus. In addition to the meaning burdensome, it means heavy so heavy that it makes it impossible for a person to function. Oppressive and grievous, severe, stern and imposing. In a few cases, the word even means violent, cruel and unsparing. While the commandments appear to so many people to be God's fun killing laws, meant to do nothing but make life miserable for us. The fact of the matter is that they are the polar opposite of that. The commandments are God's gift to us to protect and spare us from all of the things that do place unbearable burdens on us. What makes life miserable is all the things the commandments tell us not to do. Violence, infidelity, theft, slander, greed, and selfishness. These are the things that make life harder than God ever meant for it to be. 
and to protect us from these things, to turn us away from these things, and to point us in a better direction. God gave us the commandments. Is it hard to keep the commandments? Of course it is. It's very hard. Is life harder when we don't keep the commandments? Lives have been flat out ruined, destroyed, savaged because the commandments were broken. When a parent tells a small child, don't touch the stove, all that the parent is trying to do is to protect the child from being burned. The commandments work in exactly the same way. John's words that whoever loves the father loves whoever has been born of him are reassuring. We've spoken before about how John writes that because of faith, we share in God's DNA. Earlier in this epistle, John wrote, see what love the father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. We are children of God. And it's as if God is saying, love me, love my kids. We can't love God without loving his children. It's a wonderful thing to be a child of God. Look at 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 to 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? One of the most famous commercial symbols in the world is the Nike swoosh, a rounded check mark. It symbolizes one of the wings of the Greek goddess of victory, the goddess Nike, who in the Greek pantheon was said to have sat next to Zeus on Mount Olympus. In ancient mythology, it was taught that Nike flew around battlefields and, re and rewarded the courageous and victorious with laurel wreaths that they wore on their heads. In the passage we just read, the Greek word Nike appears twice. First, in the word translated overcomes, then in the word translated victory. We've spoken about this word before. It means absolute and total victory to vanquish the enemy. The Greek word Nike and its variations appear 29 times in the New Testament. 25 of those times, all but four times in the writings of John. Everyone who has been born of God and just a few lines earlier, John wrote that everyone that believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, they are the ones that have been born of God. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. It sounds like an outrageous promise. The world can throw so many hard things at us. The world throws temptation at us. The world throws hardships at us. The world, John wrote close to the beginning of this epistle, hates the children of God. The world can do so much to harm us, but John boldly declares that everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. The world can do so much harm to us, but it cannot defeat us. It's the other way around. We defeat the world. We overcome the world. There's a struggle. 
And we could well describe the struggle as a war. And in this war, we are wounded and perhaps we are even scarred. But we do not lose. The world cannot defeat us. All who are born of God overcome the world. In spite of all the wounds, in spite of all the scars. Sometimes it's really hard to believe this is really how it works. But it is what God declares through John. In fact, John wrote it three separate times in this passage. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. The victory that has overcome the world is our faith. Only one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God overcomes the world. The children of God overcome the world. The victory that overcomes the world is our faith. Only those who believe overcome the world. Three successive times, John declares that the children of God overcome the world. We share in the victory that Jesus Christ won for us. When it feels as if the world is winning, and sometimes it feels that way a lot, when it feels as if the world is winning, when it feels as if evil is winning and good is losing, when it feels as if all of the things that that we don't want to have happen, that all of those things are taking over. The fact is that everyone born of God overcomes the world. The world is losing. No matter what it might appear to us, the world is losing. It's losing because of the victory that Jesus Christ already secured when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. John goes on to remind us who Jesus is and why we can count on our victory. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 to 12. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For these are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John goes very deep in this passage. And it would not surprise me at all if his original readers struggled to understand what he was talking about. John wrote that Jesus came by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and blood. For me personally, in these words, John was referring to the baptism of Jesus and the Savior's death. It was at the Savior's baptism that the world first came to know who he was, because when he went into the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, look, 
Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We read about the Savior's baptism close to the beginning of each of the four Gospels because this event is regarded as the beginning of the Savior's public ministry. Jesus was always the Savior of the world from the moment he was conceived, from the moment he was born. But the Gospels tell us precious little about his life and work before his baptism. His baptism revealed him to the world. And his baptism is the testimony of water that John was writing about. And John added that the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit was present at the Savior's baptism. The Spirit appeared in the form of a dove. It was at the Savior's baptism in water that a voice was heard from heaven declaring, this is my son whom I dearly love and with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Jesus came by water, and not by water only, but by water and blood. When Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood in payment for the sins of the whole world. Jesus shed his blood. The spirit, the water, and the blood all agree that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Believe this, John wrote. If you believe what people tell you, John wrote, then believe what God tells you all the more. And this is what God tells us. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony of God in himself. All who do not believe this, John wrote, make God a liar because this is what God said and they have not believed it. Twice in this epistle, John speaks about people making God a liar. In the first chapter, John wrote that if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar because God says we are sinners. And now John writes that if we do not believe in Jesus, then we make God a liar because Jesus, God tells us, is our eternal life. Whoever has the Son of God has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The Greek words in this passage translated has and have is ekon, a form of the word echo, but it doesn't mean what it means in our language. It means to have the sense of possessing, owning, holding. The word appears in Matthew chapter one, where we read the angel's appearance to Joseph, the husband of Mary, and the angel told Joseph that Mary was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. The word conveys the thought of being connected, the way a mother is connected to the child in her womb. Whoever is connected to Jesus, whoever has the Son of God, has life. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Let's read to the end of the book. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 to 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. 
If anyone sees his brother committing a sin leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone that has been born of God does not keep on sinning. For he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. One of the principles of interpreting the Bible is that the Bible always interprets the Bible. We take the whole Bible together, not just one little bit of it. Taken out of context, we can prove almost anything we want with the Bible. In this section, we have two examples of how necessary it is to let the Bible speak for itself. There are some places in the Bible that appear to tell us that prayer is like magic. And when we do it just right, we can get from God whatever we want. But experience teaches us that's not true. And John explains why in this passage. When we pray according to God's will, God hears us and answers us. God's will is greater than our will. And God protects us by not answering our prayers according to our will, but according to his will. We don't always get what we pray for because God knows what is best for us. When our will is aligned with God's will, our prayers are answered the way we want them to be because then we are praying for what God wants for us. It sounds like a cop-out, doesn't it? But it isn't. Every loving parent knows you can't give your children everything they ask for. It's a perfect formula for destroying a child's life. So parents regularly say, no. And God is the most loving parent of all. Sometimes he says no. The second example in this passage of how the Bible interprets itself is in what John writes here about sin that leads to death, mortal sin, and sin that does not lead to death, sin that is not mortal. It can be very confusing. Earlier we spoke about this. This is the only place in the Bible where we read the words mortal sin and sin that is not mortal. When we allow the whole Bible to speak for itself, we learn that there is only one mortal sin, only one sin that leads to death, and that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. And that is the sin of rejecting Jesus. Just a few lines earlier in this chapter, we read that the Spirit testifies to the Son of God. And those who reject the Spirit reject his testimony. To reject Jesus is a mortal sin. To reject Jesus is to commit a sin that leads to death. All wrongdoing is sin, but all sin will be forgiven except for the sin against the Holy Spirit. There is only one mortal sin. John once again 
writes that everyone born of God does not keep on sinning. And we did our best to understand this earlier. It's a very difficult passage. In one place, John wrote that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, God forgives us. In other places, John writes that those who have been born of God no longer sin. These are not easy passages. What is easy is what John wrote about how to overcome sin. It does not happen by our own effort. We overcome sin only because God protects us and does not allow the evil one to touch us. This is our comfort and reassurance in our struggle against sin. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, John wrote. The whole world, that includes us. But he also wrote that whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Our faith gives us victory over the world. We refuse to give in to despair and we insist on clinging to hope because of Jesus. And the last thing that John wrote was that his readers must stay away from idols. Some of the idols in the ancient world are not around anymore, but many still are in different forms. And it would be easy to argue that modern idols are far more subtle and dangerous than the, than the ancient ones were. Whatever the idols are, John simply declares, stay away from them. He closes his book with one final expression of affection. In the very last line, John writes, little children, stay away from idols. It's so obvious throughout the book how much John loved his readers and his love for them reminds us of God's love for us. The book appears to end kind of abruptly. There isn't any long goodbye. John just closes with what he has to say. Little children, stay away from idols. It's another way of saying, dear ones, stay close to God. We have finished the first epistle of St. John. Good job. Next, we're going to do the second and the third epistle, and then we're gonna jump into the deep end of the pool when we start the book of Revelation. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, there are times when it feels as if the world is winning. There are times when it is so obvious that the world is under the spell of the evil one. And sometimes, Lord God, those times happen in our personal lives. Father, we praise you for the assurance that our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. We praise you for the assurance that in Jesus Christ, we have victory, we have eternal life. Thank you for guiding us through the study of this epistle of John. Continue to be with us as we continue our work in his works. Wherever we are, whatever's going on in our lives, help us always to hear your voice, listen to your word, follow you, and love you. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. See you next time. Stay well. God be with you.